Okay, welcome everybody. Um, so we have um, some speakers here today about the world of tech and we'll talk about um, different things about that. And I'm gonna introduce first to Liliana who is with Savio and she will introduce our first speaker. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. My name is Liliana de Monje. Um, we're actually neighbors. We have our corporate headquarters down the street, very close from you all, um, right across the street from the mall. So it's an absolute pleasure to connect with uh, students from high school in Culver City. I uh, hope you're all having a great day. As mentioned, my name is Liliana de Monje. I am one of the co-founders of Sabio. And Sabio is a kind of new age, newer technical school we help people like Bliss, who's on here with us today, and Carrie, who are smart and very motivated and that want to become software developers. Um, sometimes that word software development doesn't have a lot of um, resonance with people. And so basically, it's the person that creates all of the websites, all of the games that we spend our life on. And um, I know I had that epiphany when someone had to tell me, like, software is built by people. And uh, I think sometimes we lose sight of that because we never see that happening. Um, so I always like to make a point to, to just address people and say, hey, all that software that we're living on during the day when you're doing your banking, when you're on YouTube, there was a person there stitching it together character by character. And as you know, um, you can use software to do many fun things. And today we have an amazing speaker. Her name is Bliss Jasmine. She's also local, and um, Jasmine recently completed our program, and we're going to ask her a couple of questions so that she could tell us how her journey to becoming a game developer, and we also have um, her site that we can share with you all, um, and so let's click it away. Bliss, tell us a tiny bit about yourself, unmute yourself, and tell us where you're originally from, where you grew up, where you finished high school. Hi, good morning. So um, I, um, I'm originally from LA. I grew up here, um, down the street from here uh, in South Central, technically. Um, I graduated from Washington Prep High and um, I am just, bleh. my brain's a little addled right now. Um, no worries. What kind I, of things were you interested in high school? Ooh, in high school, I was very deep into Latin club and um, uh, languages. Um, my favorite course technically was biology, still is my favorite subject still technically is biology. I love everything to do with the human body, animals, and all that good stuff. Um, That's awesome. Which, yeah, which was a, a strange way to start. Um, I didn't originally want to be a game designer. It wasn't like a lifelong dream. Um, it just uh, kind of happened to me. Cool. So we also have with us today, thank you for joining us, Carrie. Uh, Carrie also recently, uh, actually a year ago, she graduated from our program as well. She trained in Culver City. And as soon as she graduated, we were able to help her connect with a really cool uh, tech startup. And she and two other people um, have been putting together a really cool uh, community-based app. And we will definitely hear about that. Carrie, introduce yourself a tiny bit. Tell us where you're originally from. Um, hi, I'm Carrie, and I am from San Diego. Awesome. And tell us a little bit about what you originally cared about when you were in high school. Um, okay, so in high school, I actually really liked computers, but I wasn't super good at math. So my parents told me that I shouldn't do computers because you have to be good at math, which is like not that true. Um, and, but I was also like, I was really into biology and chemistry, so I had plans of becoming a doctor. So I went to UCSB as like a biomed, like a pre-med thing, and I didn't like it, so I switched majors. <laughs> so. That's great. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that happens, right? We all start in one place, and as we do different things, we refine you know, those things that really bring us joy and, and that we're interested in. So Bliss, uh, going back to you a little bit, tell us a little bit about how, I know you're a military veteran. Thank you so much for your service. Can you tell us a little bit about when you joined the military and what um, cool things you were able to do as being part of a military member? Uh, yeah. 
Um, so I joined in 2009, shortly after um, Obama was uh, inaugurated as president. And um, I originally uh, went in uh, because I was living in Fresno and there was no jobs. It was right during the, the recession. So I, I needed something to pay bills with and I had no other options. So I joined um, late February, literally like three days before my birthday. And uh, went off to boot camp, spent eight weeks there and was blown away by the similarities to my home life <laughs> and what boot camp was. But afterwards I was uh, able to go to a technical school where they taught me how to be a photographer and a journalist. So I um, it was able to learn how to be a real photographer. And that was basically my career in the military of being a Navy photographer for um, first, the USS Stennis, which is a aircraft carrier based in Washington. I think it's still based in Washington. And, um, and then for the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California, where they train all of the officers in additional, giving them additional education. They can get PhDs and master, master's degrees and do really cool sciencey things. Um, they work closely with NASA and being able to document and take pictures of all that stuff was really, really cool. That is amazing. Do you have, since now you are a software developer, have you created some type of online portfolio that uh, has all of your photos? How does that work when, when you're a member of the military and you're doing all this awesome creative work? Do you own that work or do you have access to it? Tell us a little bit about that. So as a military photographer, your work is technically owned by the government, but it's also publicly available to anyone. So oh, nice. um, yeah, so if you type in my name into Google and put USS Stennis, you can see my pictures, you can use my pictures, you can do whatever you want with them. Uh, as a military member, you don't own the pictures that you take for the military, they're public use. Um, Very cool. So you could create something that compiles all your work as long as it's public access. Technically, yeah. Um, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of my specific photography was dedicated to classified information. So oh. a lot of it isn't accessible for anybody. But um, uh, the stories that I've written uh, at the Naval Postgraduate School and all that stuff are, are available and can be accessed. That's so awesome. So Carrie, let's talk a little bit about um, your experience in college. Um, did you tinker around with any computers, coding? Um, did you try to kind of weave it into any of the, the majors that you were doing? Tell us a little bit about um, how you kind of, because it sounds like you had a passion for software developments for computers from an early age. So were you able to kind of um, exploit that in any way while you were an undergrad? Yeah, a little bit. So I had um, a lot of friends who were um, computer science majors. So a lot of the time I would just ask them for their coursework and like do it with them. So that's what I did in college. Like if you're interested in doing this stuff, like you don't have to do this in, in, in college because <laughs> you can go to a boot camp like I did. But I thought it was really interesting and cool and helpful. So that I did do a lot of computer stuff and I took like free online classes in my free time just to, to learn because it was something that I really liked. So. That's awesome. Um, and so Bliss, going back to you, once you, how long did you serve in the military and then what was your path post-military? So um, when I, I served six years in the military um, plus two years of inactive uh, reserves. Um, but my path going out, I thought that I would, you know, stick with the photography and maybe go into the, uh, the entertainment industry as a cinematographer. Uh, and I realized, no, I never really liked photography. I was just good at it. <laughs> so um, I, I did a little dipping and had some conversations with family members who had completed school and done a bunch of stuff and uh, decided, you know, I play video games. Throughout my entire life, I've played video games and uh, done cool stuff like that and made up games to play with my cousin and things. Um, and one day my brother just said, why don't you just go learn how to be a video game designer? And I was like, that's not a thing. <laughs> yeah. 
And lo and behold, you know, you type in video game design school and the, a bunch pop up now. Um, it wasn't a thing when I graduated high school or it wasn't like a course that you could take when I graduated high school in 2005. But now, nowadays, you can definitely go and get a degree in video game design and development. Um, so I went to the Los Angeles Film School and they have a course that's very similar to the um, Full Sail University degree. And actually they're sister schools, so the, the curriculum is almost identical. Um, but uh, I spent three years doing an accelerated program, learning how to develop and design games from scratch and all that good stuff. And I worked with a lot of people, even though I was literally the only girl there. <laughs> and uh, thankfully I wasn't the only black person there, but I was only the only girl there most of the time. Um, so it was a very interesting thing to go through an accelerated program and see how to not only think like a game designer, but to think like a, like a kid who is playing with new toys that didn't come with directions. That's interesting. Can you talk a tiny bit, uh, you, you made these two statements about design and development. Can you go into that a tiny bit more for some of the students here that are thinking, like, what do those words mean? What, what are some tools that are different? Like, why is there a, a, a separation? Um, and do you recommend that people kind of pick design or development? Or do you need to do both? Well, you definitely don't need to do both. Um, I've, I chose to do both because of the way the games that I'm, that I want to create for people don't really have a, a niche. It's very niche -y. It's not something that people are creating right now. It's definitely not a Call of Duty type of thing. Um, but as far as the difference between de design and development is, design is the actual creation of the game world and the design of characters, the telling of the story, and the development part is where you actually take those ideas and you make them a reality. So um, when you're going to school to, to learn it, um, you want to make sure you choose what it is you're trying to actually do. Uh, so I wanted very much to have that designer's mindset so that I could fully know how to create my own games. Uh, and then I went to Savio because I wanted to know how to put those games on the internet and um, make a fully functional game that by myself without having to worry about, you know, selling my ideas to a company that's going to maybe not do it exactly how I want it. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, Carrie, going back to you, can you tell us a little bit, you know, once you finished college, what kind of what were your plans? And what did you end up doing post uh, securing your, your degree? Um, <clears throat> so my plans originally were to go to law school. Um, both of my parents are lawyers and I actually like took the LSAT and everything and applied, but that wasn't really a passion of mine. It was more just like, I felt like I should do something after college. Um, and the degree that I got is like global studies. So it's like international relations sort of. So you either go to grad school, you go to law school, or you get a job in like marketing or something, which I wasn't interested in. So after that, I like talked to the, one of my family friends who has known me since I was a baby who went to Sabio, um, just about boot camps because I was always really interested in computers as I was mentioned prior, but I just didn't understand or like really see any path to break into the tech industry. Um, but after talking about like boot camp in general, researching on my own, and then speaking with one my friends who went to Sabio, um, that was kind of like a clear cut path for me because it seemed like the like the um, placement ratings of like how quickly you get a job out of boot camp were high, and also looking at the demand in the the workforce for software developers was really strong too. So I just felt like the logical choice, as well as a choice that I was like really passionate about going into so that's awesome and so before you joined our program because you started with us last january is that correct yeah correct yeah so january in and you graduated in may of the previous year um i graduated in june of the june 2018 yeah okay so you had about six months 
Um, did you do any like free online classes? Like how, what kind of, what are some actionable steps that you took in those six months to kind of explore your options and then say, okay, I've decided I'm going to learn to code and become a professional. How did you make use of those six months from graduating from your college to enrolling in a software development program like Savio? Right. So um, a lot of that time was spent just researching boot camps in general because it's a pretty like it's not a, a negligible amount of money that you're paying for these programs. So I wanted to make sure that it was worth it and that I was going to pick the right one. And I actually originally was going to go to one in San Diego, um, but they got shut down by the California state government because they weren't um, like they basically weren't following the rules of like what you need to be to be like a accredited institution. And um, thank God for that. But I actually went through all of their pre-work and I was interested in it and I completed all of it. Um, I met with the CEO and then like a week after I met with him, he was like, we're actually not accepting students now because we're getting shut down. So those were the steps that I took and I was already pretty invested in it. Um, luckily I didn't, um, pay for the pre-work so that's good um that's but awesome. yeah just yeah continue and did you do any online classes that you liked and that you recommended that you think might be good for people who are just starting to think like hey maybe i might want to do software development are there any like tools that were in good for you that you thought were engaging and helpful yeah so i i really liked uh free code academy um it provides a lot of like really basic tutorials that can help you really just like get a taste of what software development is like without really diving too deep into it. And they hold your hand a lot. So it's really helpful and can help you um, kind of just get a glimpse into like what software development looks like. Um, I also what, took a couple of free courses on Udemy and then the Harvard CS50 class, which is free um, for like anyone who wants to take it is also really helpful. And that goes a little more in depth into like actual theory of CS. Um, if you're like really want to dive a little bit deeper than just like tutorials on Free Code Academy. That's awesome. Bliss, do you have, um, did you ever participate uh, or use any like free online kind of very introductory resources that you've come across that you think are, uh, might be a good resource for students that want to start thinking about possibly uh, dipping their toe in the game development and design world that you'd like to share with us? Um, actually, I didn't dive into any of those things. Um, I had been a, um, a heavy D&D &D player uh, for the longest Dungeons time. and Dragons? Yeah. So, um, I, I learned a lot of the basics from playing games like that. Um, because a lot of what you have to do in, in tabletop role-playing games is you're, you're not reliant on actual like visuals or anything. You have to make up that stuff off the top of your head. So it was more of a getting your hands into the actual game and, and learning how to role play uh, with a person, whether it was face to face or on the internet, um, playing uh, like on Zoom and stuff like this. So, um, the when I was looking at design schools, I um, the first thing I looked at was stuff on Udemy and uh, watching YouTube uh, YouTube videos of game devs that uh, post their game diaries or dev diaries on YouTube. Got it. Very cool. Um, thank you for that. So if you want to be a game developer, go and buy Dungeons and Dragons so that you can learn some very fundamental concepts of, of game theory, probably, um, as it is the most classic uh, role playing game. Um, so let's chat a little bit about what your experience was uh, learning how to code, becoming a software developer in a three month intensive program. How, how um, Bliss, how was that? Um, um, you know, what does that look like? Uh, what is that school? What does a coding boot camp look like compared to the formal education that you received at the, the, um, the film school that you went to? Can you talk a little bit about that to give students an idea of what that experience is like? Uh, well, it's very a uh, fish out of water type of experience at first. Um, when I, when I was looking for coding boot camps, I was looking kind of for the same teaching style that I was used to, which is 
more hands off. You do it. We, we show you the basics and then you go off and do something and then we'll show you a little bit more and then you go off and do something. Um, but as far as what it started, the pre-work is what I probably had the most issue with because uh, I'm a very visual learner. So I need to see somebody do it and then I can do it. Um, <laughs> so trying to figure out how to just read what was asked of me and then type it out <laughs> into this foreign language that doesn't make any sense because it's more symbols and numbers and letters and stuff and just throw it all together and it somehow works like magic. Um, but I, it was definitely a very fish out of water type thing. And, but as, as the weeks went on, it wasn't even actually not even weeks as the days went on, uh, the more I was exposed to uh, the wording of what the language of coding and what was being asked, I was able to kind of grasp the little straws that I was given and turn it into something that actually functioned on a web page. Did some people describe getting like a little bug when you like type something and then it works and something happens and you're like, oh my God, I did that. Did you, did you, uh, do you remember that moment? Did you have that kind of a moment? Because I've had I, many students that talk about that. I, when it first happened, it was like, I literally stood up and was like, yes, I did it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I still have those moments. So it's not something that is like you have, you have the one time and then, you're like, okay, this is it. I've got it. No, it happens literally throughout your, even not learning anymore. I still have, you know, you struggle with something and then it works and you're like, yes, okay, moving on. <laughs> you try not to celebrate so much, but those little, it's those little things. One line of code can break everything to the point where I believe I got stuck for like several hours and I know I should have just asked for help, but I didn't. And then I finally asked for help and it was because of one little letter was out of place <laughs> and deleted that one little letter and everything worked. And I was like, oh my God, why didn't I just, <sighs> okay, let's move on. We got it working. Mm, I can steam forward. That's awesome. That's awesome. So when did you finish the program? The, I finished on May 15th. So just literally this month. Okay, awesome. Congratulations. Um, Carrie, tell us a tiny bit about your experience. I know you had a cool group. Maybe there was like 10, 15 people, your senior instructor. What was it like learning to code in a structured environment for three intensive months? Um, it was a lot. I mean, it was like 10, 12 hour days because I would usually get there kind of early. But um, it was really fun. It definitely feels at the beginning you feel like you're drowning because you kind of are, but you figure it out. And like the instructors are always there to help you out and they kind of know when you need help and when you can figure it out yourself. So that's good. Um, I really enjoyed it because it's, it's very hands off and like you can teach stuff yourself and like learn it online. So it's a lot of like being resourceful and dependent on yourself, which is really good. And then when you're super stuck or like you need more guidance, like you can ask the instructors and it's they're very helpful like happy to help and I they don't they also don't give you the answer right away which I really liked um they kind of just give you like breadcrumbs and like you can figure it out like and guide you towards the direction of like fixing it but I thought it was really enjoyable it was cool I liked my cohort a lot how big was your cohort how many people were you in a group with in I a think classroom? it was like six, 16 16 maybe around there and did so, that, like, how did, how does like a coding boot camp for these young students that we have here today, how, how is it compare going through like an intensive 12 hour day versus, you know, like a, a week at a, at a university? What is that experience like? Is it just really different? Is it both fun and unique? You still build relationships. What is that comparison for, for these young uh, people who are about to embark on their, their next journey? Yeah, I would say it's definitely different um, because like when you're in college, you're surrounded by a bunch of people who are your age. And then I was the youngest in my cohort because I was 22. Um, so I was like fresh out of college, but I was still able to make a lot of like really great friends and people that I am actually still in contact with today. Um, it's different because it's so fast paced. Like when you're in college, you're working a lot, but you get breaks um, at boot camp. 
you kind of are just going all the time and it's really for the benefit of yourself because you're the one who's paying the money for this so like of course I want to get my money's worth and perform um I'm not going to slack off so that's awesome wonderful so Bliss tell us a little bit about post boot camp you graduated two weeks ago um tell us what you are now doing what are you able to do now that you've gone through 12 weeks of intensive technical training that you weren't able to do prior to joining the program what skills did you pick up so um since i graduated i've been uh starting my own little business um to create or my own little studio to create games um what i wasn't able to do before the boot camp was uh take my ideas and actually code them out. Um, I, I, I knew a little bit of code, but it wasn't really enough to, to do anything with. It was more of a, if you look on my website, the little games that I created there uh, was pretty much it. They're one thing and that's it. Um, but now, um, now that I know more about the, the, the background of what coding is and how to actually make something work, um, I can actually make my little car game into what it's what was supposed to be, what the idea was, which is driving in, in traffic in Los Angeles. So that's hilarious. Um, yeah, so I can I can actually fully let fully function put that put that sorry put those ideas out and actually fully write the code that makes them work. Awesome. That's great. Um, Carrie, tell us a tiny bit about, um, you finished the program. What, what, what happened after that? And tell us about what you're doing now. Um, so after I finished the program, I went uh, and I was applying for jobs. I think I applied to like a thousand jobs. It was a lot. Um, but that's just like what you do. And like, you only need a single like, yes. And then that totally washes away all like the rejections that you get. Um, which is great. Um, I ended up with two offers at the end of my job search and I actually landed a job, I think uh, about three weeks after I graduated. Um, cause I was, I was really motivated to get a job and, uh, Liliana actually recommended me to the current position that I'm at right now. Um, I work for a startup called mesh. Um, and I'm also currently the lead engineer. Um, so in, under like about a year because i've been with the company since may 20th so a little over a year now i've grown a lot like you grow so much more even after boot camp because like you're growing during boot camp and you're learning during boot camp but the thing that i really love the most about this this field in general is like you're constantly learning it doesn't matter like what you're doing as long as you're working then you're going to be learning something new and you'll be improving on things and you if you like to solve problems and puzzles like is totally the field for you because that feeling of like that aha moment when you can make something work is it happens like almost every day well, unless you're super stuck but sometimes that happens so so can you talk a tiny bit about um what does it mean to launch an app like how uh -huh. are you guys launching it to the ios store are you doing android um and what does your app do tell us what what mesh is about Right. So we are actually like, it's a soft launch. So we're on the Google play store and we're also on the um, iOS app store right now, but it's beta. So invite only, um, working up to launching an app is a lot of work. It's just insanity because like, of course, as soon as you add a new feature or you fix something, you introduce like six other bugs, which is like super annoying, but that's part of the job. And then, um, what our app does is it's kind of like a, an almost like a social media platform for community leaders and community members to organize, monetize, and network with brands. And we also, um, we don't sell user data. So all user data and all community data is encrypted and it's owned by the community themselves as well as the users. So um, the way that we are monetizing and hoping to make money off of it because we're still um, a super small startup um, is by having revenue through like a subscription type of uh, platform. So the community leaders would be the ones who collect the subscription fees, um, which would then pay for like their ability to use the app. 
So instead of selling user data and selling everything about you to the highest bidder, um, it actually belongs to you so that we're not infringing upon your own privacy. That is so cool. Can I get an invite? I want to create a, a Sabio Mesh community. <laughs> Tell yeah, Drew I need um, an invite. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to Drew about that. <laughs> okay, awesome. Um, all right, wonderful. Well, I, I mean, it's thank you ladies for helping me go through your, your life. I appreciate it. I definitely want to open this up. I know we have a good number of students on here. Um, you know, we're all West Side folks uh, would love to open this up so that you guys can ask these amazing ladies that are super technical, creative, super smart. They're building the tech that we are all going to be using um, and would love to hear from you all. Please, uh, Adrian, I don't know how you handle questions if people just unmute themselves or if you have them in a queue, but I would definitely want the ladies to interact with your students. Yeah, if you want to speak up and ask a question or you can put it in the chat either way, um, we would all love to answer your questions. And Mr. Davis as well. Or Mr. Rojas, if you have questions, Eddie, who's going to be the first one to ask a question? Well, I see a question in the chat and it says, which boot camps do you recommend? Um, I recommend Savio because <laughs> I obviously I'm biased. I went there, but I have, I've had a bunch of friends of mine who like they got like a job right out of college and like a year later, like two years later, they don't like it. So they've been contacting me about boot camps because that's something that they're interested in. And I always recommend Savio, um, even if they don't live in state. Um, Cause I moved up to LA. So I was living down in San Diego and I moved up to LA to attend Savio um, just because the way that they, I mean, I don't know if like Gregorio or Liliana has talked about it, but like they pair you up with, our startup and you build an, an app or like a project for that startup. So when you go into like looking for a job on your resume, you list that you actually worked for a startup and it's a lot, it's more different from other boot camps where they kind of have you do a bunch of like self-guided mini projects that don't really have a lot of meaning. Like they'll have you make a tic-tac-toe game, which like everyone can make. You can like go on to Free Code Academy and learn how to make it. And it's just, it, it doesn't pull a lot of weight on your resume, uh, whereas Sabio does, and also the community that you get with Sabio expands like way past graduation, at least for me, because you can decide whether or not you want to continue to participate. But I think it's a really valuable space and something that, to have access to. So I totally recommend Sabio. <laughs> but you. there's yeah, there's one boot camp like you will often see like it's called like trilogy boot camps. Um, where they partner up with like a university and they have a boot camp and I don't recommend those like really at all. One of my friends went to one and it's kind of just like they do sink or swim, but the instructors don't help you that much and they don't really help you with the job search after. So I have a question. Yes, question. First of all, thank you for uh, nice words. Um, can you tell us a little bit about? I, I wanted to ask. I guess the question is. Tell us a little bit about like what's your regular day, but also <clears throat> like what's the what's the more most surprising thing in your day in your day to day life as a as a developer that again it was surprising that you didn't really uh, you weren't really expecting um, now that you're there. Um. So my day to day is like I code all day basically, um, and I have meetings a lot with the product team. Um, too, but it's mostly coding. So that's what my day looks like, but I love it because it's just like solving logic pu puzzles a lot of the time and building stuff. So it's really creative too. Um, the most surprising part of my day to day, I guess, is how quickly time passes because I really do love what I do. So like I wake up and start working and then it'll be like 7 p.m. at night and I didn't even notice. So then I stopped working, but it's just like how much I love my job is really surprising to me. And I think I'm really, I'm very grateful for that as well. well wonderful. And, you know, I'd like to kind of echo what you said about the field and what we do on a day to day. It's called computer science, uh, but there's a lot of design, right? In the science that we do and the, the hard 
uh, ones and zeros that we work with, there's a lot of design that you have to really bring creativity uh, to what you code and how you code. Uh, so you get to flex a lot of different muscles uh, as a software developer. And so, so that's what I wanted to add. Uh, I'll leave it uh, for the students to ask more questions. Bliss, do you want to chime in and tell people what is it like to be a game developer for eight hours a day? <laughs> um, so I actually have worked at a uh, game design company. Um, we, uh, a lot of what I did there and what I'm doing now is um, not specifically coding. I do code. Uh, I make myself code uh, at least three hours a day at the very minimum. Sometimes it goes longer, but a lot of it is actually writing out like problems and uh, like Carrie said, solving logic issues. Um, like for instance, I have a little dungeon game that I've been working on <laughs> and uh, I literally, you have to play the games in order to make sure that they work. So I spent a lot of my day uh, designing a game and then uh, playing it actually. As my mom says all the time, all you do is play. And I'm like, yeah, but it's work. <laughs> so it's fun. And uh, sometimes I get a little carried away and start playing a little too much. And then I have to reel myself back in. But um, yeah, a lot of it is solving, uh, solving the puzzles that come with what makes a game fun. And um, then making those changes that will make it a little bit more challenging than it would be if you were just to put in cheat codes and let, let stuff go with it, do whatever you want. So um, we have a question in the, in the chat. What are your favorite programming languages and why? Uh, Carrie, Bliss. Um, I work with a lot of JavaScript right now. It's definitely not my favorite language. I actually really don't like it, <laughs> but it's just the language that like my we work with React Native, so it allows us to develop iOS and Android and web all at the same time with the same code base. So that's why we're using JavaScript and we're looking to switch over to TypeScript. Um, I really like uh, C Sharp or really any kind of strongly typed language. So I really like Python too. Um, reasons why is just type checking makes it a lot easier to find bugs. And when, with at least with C Sharp, when you can catch bugs at compile time, um, that really helps. So that just helps with debugging. But a lot of like favorite languages is kind of a interesting question because a lot of the time when you talk to like really more experienced programmers, like my boss, so he's been doing it for like 25 years. He is like very, he's like, I'm language agnostic. I just choose the best tool for the problem. So it's really not so much like about the languages that you know, but picking and like always being willing to learn new things. Cause like you can pick up new languages super easily in this field. Yeah, same. I don't have a, a specific language that I love to code in. I preferred a couple of languages. Uh, JavaScript is also not my favorite either. It's it's just a little too loose. <laughs> so you, you, you have a lot more leeway to make mistakes and, and that leads to a lot, more, a lot more bugs and a lot harder time finding them. Um, but yeah, Please. definitely C Sharp. Hmm? Are you using C Sharp to build your games right now? What languages are you using right now on a daily basis to build your games? Um, I originally was using C Sharp and I still use that as like the base code, but um, since going to Sabio, I've learned that it's a little bit more easier if you use um, React Native and JavaScript. So I'm in the same boat as Carrie. I'm painting through it because it's a necessary evil, but um, definitely using a lot more JavaScript than I would like to. Awesome. Um, so someone asked a question for me. Vasilia wants to know in the boot camp, uh, do you choose languages? We have two options. You can do JavaScript or C Sharp. And as Mr. Alex is, Mr. Davis is mentioning, C Sharp is similar to Java that you guys are doing in computer science, which is great. Um, the other question is, is the boot camp equivalent to how many years in university? So we actually have um, 
a program that we're about to launch with National University. And so if you go through our program, uh, you will earn three college classes, credit for three classes at National University. So I will share all that gory detail um, with Adrian, and she can share it with your instructors um, as soon as that uh, is live, which will happen hopefully within the next week or two. So there is a way for you to go through our program and, and get equivalent of three college courses. Can I, can I add on to that? Yeah, the, the, the comparison of what you do in a university and the type of university courses that there are, um, as opposed to what we in the boot, in the boot camp, there's definitely overlap, right? There's absolutely uh, a lot of overlap, but then there's some differences that are important when we consider time and, and what your goal is. Right. So uh, as Leanna mentioned right now, we are uh, about to launch a program with a university. I mean, that's just one. We're in conversation and have been in conversation and talked to many university um, academic chairs, et cetera. I mean, a whole host of, of different people in that space. Because uh, I myself, you know, I myself uh, did not get a degree in computer science. I started out uh, like a lot of people do uh, in a different thing. And so but what, uh, to, to come back to the specific answers, they, you know, at a university, their, their goal is a little different than a boot camp. Uh, so, for example, like our pre-work course itself, um, which is like the prerequisite to get into the boot camp. Um, I just took one of the, uh, you know, to get those college credits, you got to take a, you got to test out of one of those classes. I, I tested out one of the classes i took one of those tests and it's essentially our pre-work covers one of their 400 level courses 400 level course and that's our pre-work and so what we teach is different because everything in in you know uh, uh bliss and, and carrie here can can let give me some feedback here live when you come into the, our boot camp our, our our only goal is make you a good contributor to your team like make sure that when you leave here you are functional and you can do the work and make your boss happy. Um, that's not necessarily all the time that you spend in a university. And that's not bad, that's just different, right? So uh, for example, uh, one of the university people, one of the university instructors that I've talked to in the past, um, they've, they've told me that a lot of their students, seniors in college, they don't actually spend a lot of time coding um because they spend a lot of the time writing papers and again it's different and it, and it provides a, a different level and a different skill of writing uh the wonderful theory of computer science but it, it's not coding and it, they brought it up because he was a little puzzled as to like how are you going to go get a job coding uh if you're writing papers all the time like what's up uh, and the, his answer, what they told him was like, hey, we just code on our own. Like we just spend our weekends coding to make sure we get that coding in, right? And so it's just a little different experience. Uh, while what we do here, again, and I'm the, I didn't get a chance to introduce myself. I'm the head instructor at Salvio. Uh, I've been in technology since, uh, I've been in technology for a really long time, 20 years now. Um, and the way we formulated what we do in our boot camp uh, has been in my experience, with the goal being that, hey, if the people coming out of this program, I would want them to be the type of person uh, that would come into uh, if I was hiring them. Uh, because one of the things that you'll hear about if you do some research as to like what happens and um, what's the state of computer science and how do employers view uh, the computer science uh, student population, the general answer is that they're not happy. There's a lot of shortfalls. Because again, the, um, that particular computer science programs aren't really necessarily 110% preparing them for the jobs that we got going on today, which is just a lot. There's just a lot of work, as you mentioned, as, uh, as Carrie and, and Bliss have been talking about. They mentioned a lot of different technologies, a lot, which is one of the problems about learning the code today. What do you do? You know, how many different languages could you possibly write in? I mean, you know, there's JavaScript and then there's TypeScript that's going to write JavaScript for you. And there's just so much going on that it's really difficult for, um, you know, academic programs and, and curriculums to kind of keep up with all the changing uh, needs. 
Uh, I don't want to talk too much. I could talk about this stuff forever. So I'll just, I'll leave my answer there. Thank you for that. Uh, someone else, anyone else have any other questions for these ladies? Um, you know, one thing that we haven't talked about um, and that it cannot be taboo, we got to talk about dollar dollar bills. Is, are these fields lucrative? Are you going to be able to pay LA rents? Right, like that's the number one. I know that's a concern for a lot of people, right? You, you do what you're good at, you do what you like, but if you are doing this software development work, are you going to get the bag? Carrie, tell us, is it lucrative? Um, yeah, it's definitely, you can make a lot of money in this field for sure. Um, especially given the current like workforce of there's still gonna be developers in demand no matter what. And I don't think that's gonna change like at all, especially as technology moves forward. Um, starting like right after when I got my offer, um, the first offer I got from the other business was 75 and then the where I work now, I was offered 80 with equity. And as a first job, like right out of college, that's amazing. I had a lot of friends who got right out of college and they didn't go into the tech field. So their salaries were gonna be less anyway, but like they were making like 45, 50, which is a good salary for starting out of college, but it's nicer to make more money, obviously. <laughs> um, that's amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. And yeah. so is there also opportunity to grow that salary once you've been in the industry or do you kind of stay at 80? Oh, no, you can you can definitely grow that salary a lot. I actually recently um, got a raise for my annual like review um, and I'm planning on getting more. So that's yeah, it's 80 per year. Yeah. And then, that's awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. But I mean, I have friends who work in the Bay and they are making like 140. So you can definitely move up. Yeah, lots of room for growth. Bliss, is there money in game development? Oh, definitely. You know, <laughs> microtransactions and all that stuff. Um, the way I'm planning on doing my games, uh, it's a little bit more of a uh, non nonprofit type of thing. So uh, a lot of my source of incomes will be grants, government grants, city grants and stuff like that. That's awesome. That's a great way. Yeah. So you can do the for profit, the nonprofit, game development, design, app, shipping apps to the app store. Um, there's just so much that can be done. Um, there's a question here uh, for you, Carrie. So I'm just going to read it out loud. Um, did your college degree make a difference in getting your current position? Um, I don't think so. I mean, no. My college degree was literally just like international relations. And it was something that I'm still really passionate about, but it didn't help me get my job. So there's like so many of my friends who all graduated and they're working in fields that are not related to their degree at all. I went to uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, UCSB. UCSB. Yeah. If, if I may but add yeah. in here just some more stats uh, about this, uh, the median salary coming out of our program, uh, no, the average salary coming out of our program is $73,000. And why is that important? That number is important because I think the median salary in LA is close to like maybe fifty-eight, sixty thousand dollars for a household, right? So the household, call it sixty grand, one person coming out of the program, seventy-three k, uh, really impactful. You know what? What Carrie uh, just answered the question about the the university. It's always really hard for an individual to say like, well, you know, if I would have been a different person, how would things have shaken out? Because you just don't know how people are looking at you. So that's, that's really a hard question to, to factor in. We'd have to get her boss and you know, make sure her boss is being honest about the whole thing and yeah. what, what the boss says about that. So it's difficult though. So, but what I will tell you is, you know, we've had a lot of people under 21 come through our program um, that don't have a degree. Uh, they have a high school diploma, um, have zero or random number of, of community college uh, years, right? So we've had students that, you know, went like one semester to four different community colleges. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing what happens after you, you leave high school. There's a lot of different roads. Uh, but even the folks under 21, they come out and they, they make really good money. Um, the, the, the thing that I like to point out, especially when I talk to 
we're talking to younger folks, there's a, there's a real nasty side to tech in that it's kind of biased towards youth. So if you're not one of the youngins, like uh, it doesn't work out, it's, it's a little harder for you. So I don't mind saying here, saying this in a room full of, of young folks, um, but so there's a flip side of them being a little biased towards young people is that your young people, they're, they're actually biased towards you. So there's a lot of nice things that a lot of like pros that you get like, hey, yeah, this is kind of what we expect. Uh, a young person coming out of high school, coming out of community college, coming out of college and, and, and being independent and thinking like, hey, I want to I want to solve problems. Like that just kind of fits the, the stereotype of what uh, technology wants. And so there's a nice little advantage there that you can you can hook into. And then later, as you transition into being a little older, you, you leverage experience uh, over that. Um, so that's really important to, um, to, to keep in mind that things are, are definitely uh, in your favor. Uh, and then once you go there, one of the things that Carrie mentioned, I believe, is you're always learning, right? So sometimes people ask me, like, what's the, what's the, what's the catch? It seems a little weird. Uh, everything seems so great. The catch is you always got to be learning. Like you always got to be learning, like the stuff that you're doing today, uh, stuff I'm going to go back and when I start coding in today and Bliss and, 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 and Carrie, what we're going to do is we got problems to solve and these problems are going to get solved with coding. Um, and sometimes the coding that we're going to be doing is new because it's a new language and sometimes it's just going to be a new problem, right, with new variables uh, that get introduced and we go and solve that with code. That's all what we do. And so you learn and learn and more every day. And that's really the downside to it, that you just got to be willing to set up the day like, hey, in the morning, you're going to wake up, get your coffee, and you're on. Your mind's got to be on. Um, and you got to be working on um, throughout most of the day. Now, nice thing is that, you know, people really love you because you do a lot of, uh, I have been talking to Carrie about her job, and I know her boss loves her. Um, and... Uh, when your boss loves you and really, really wants you to come into work the next day, uh, there's a really nice uh, feeling that you get knowing that you're appreciated uh, at a certain level and that, you know what, your job is going to be there, right? Your job is going to be there. I think you all, um, even though you're young, you might have already, you might already know one or two adults that feels like, man, is my job not going to be there tomorrow? Or you feel stuck, right? And so knowing that your job is going to be there or that you're not stuck and you have some choices, um, is a really important thing to, to consider about uh, these fields in technology. Yeah, wonderful. Just to add, add oh, on yeah. to that, yeah, just the whole like knowing your job is going to be there. There's also a lot of like even if you don't like your job in this field, there's so many other jobs. Like, and you can't really say the same about other fields. Like, I could probably quit my job today. I'm not gonna, but <laughs> I could, and I could probably easily find another job within a month. Like, it's there's a lot of options for you to grow and expand. Whereas some career paths, like you get that job and you move up two or three times, but then you're like that for the rest of your life. That's awesome. Well, um, thank you ladies. Thank you, Bliss. Thank you, Carrie. Um, I really appreciate you making time to be so open and frank, sharing your story with these students. I think it's so important to get people um, to interact. Uh, I have added my LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn is where professionals network. So uh, I'm sure you all are going to start to delve into that world. Please feel free to connect with me there if you would like. We do also have a free JavaScript class, which is a great way for everybody to just begin doing some front end development. It sounds like a lot of students here are already doing Java, which is amazing. So if you pair some JavaScript with some Java, then you full stack web developer, you add a little database to that and you can create amazing things online. Um, so that class is completely free. It's 14 hours of JavaScript concepts. And then you also will get access to some free office hours. Um, if any of the instructors are interested in having us do a workshop for you all, we would love to do that as well next time to make it a little bit more technical um, with uh, Gregorio. Um, and um, you can find these two ladies on LinkedIn as well. And uh, I posted Bliss's uh, site. Hopefully you will be posting some additional games that we can all play with uh, and provide feedback for you in the near future. As I mentioned, Sabi is right down the street. We're right across the street from the mall in Culver City. Um, we definitely wanna be good neighbors. Uh, we've been interacting with um, 
your counselor for a couple of years now. And so we're really excited to have this opportunity to share uh, things with you. Um, the link is right here for the class. It's right there, that LMS, uh, sabio.la. It's an online class. It's a free online class. It's open to absolutely everybody, yourself, your aunts, your uncles, um, no cost, and it does come with some live support. So unless anybody has any additional questions, I like to be punctual uh, and uh, it's noon. Um, we will go ahead and say goodbye. Thank you everybody for coming and uh, yeah, we'll talk soon. Have Thank you for having us. Thank Have you. a great day. Thank you speakers.